People ask me, why do you do it? What makes you want to fly and share it with the world? And if I answer them honestly, I would say, I don't know. It's just something you're born with. My childhood is filled with memories on Navy bases. The sound, the smell, and the feel of an afterburner on takeoff. I always knew I wanted to be a pilot, but missed out on having that relationship with me. But what if you were given a chance at that? What if you were handed a gift of digitized 8mm and cockpit voice recordings? I'm not actually going to take them now. Naval Aviator and OG YouTuber. I knew I had to put this puzzle together and knew exactly who could help me do it. Commander Steve Cobra Queen, U.S. Navy retired. And Commander Bill Willie Driscoll, U.S. Navy retired. Come along on this multi-part series as we dive into the Duck Chronicles and try to tell the stories that the OG YouTuber never got to. It is my pleasure to uh have Commander Bill Willie Driscoll with me here on the channel. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. I'm sending warm greetings from San Diego, and I'm uh, real pleased to to be a part of this. So we had a chance encounter at Oshkosh. Uh, we were both there. You and Duke Cunningham were there uh, talking about that infamous day in May of 1972. You said, what was that name again? And I said, Gary Kincaid. And you, you said, I knew Gary. I flew with Gary. I said, do you mind if we could connect somehow? And you said, absolutely. And you've agreed to sit down and do this. So I, I thank you for your time and, and welcome to the channel. As mentioned, I, I did know your dad. He, he and I were uh, fellow students going through the RAG of the replacement air group out at uh, VF-121 in San Diego. So we were together for a year and a half going through that training. Mm -hmm. And then he came back again to, I uh, guess he got selected. Only about the 2% of the top aviators get selected to go through Top Gun. And he came back as a student going through Top Gun when I was on the staff. So I, I knew I knew Gary. Uh, I think his call sign was because he walked like a duck. Um, yeah, yeah, mad duck. So uh, so the story goes that uh, the first time he put on all that flight gear, he was only uh, about 5'8", um, and he had short little squatty legs. And uh, so right. the, the story goes that he put on all that flight gear, and his first uh, uh, cat shots or, or two off the uh, Kitty Hawk, he waddled across that deck to get to the airplane. And they said, look at that mad duck go. And, of course, he, he didn't like that. He let him know he didn't like it. And, and of course, when you, when you uh, show any emotion or reaction, it sticks, right? That becomes your call sign. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, yeah. So, um, uh, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that you approached us at Oshkosh. And I, I did know your dad. We weren't, like, best friends, but, uh, sure. but, but we were friends. And I knew him for the year and a half. We went through the rag together as, as fellow students. And and again, uh, I was real pleased when he got selected to go through Top Gun. And I, you know, because we had known each other during our rag days, we spent more than a little bit of time at the Austin's Club <laughs> after hours just talking about how things were going for him and mm -hmm. Top Gun and, and life and that kind of thing. So, yeah. So with, with that as a backdrop, I'm happy to answer any questions you might want to ask me about, about your dad. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Well, let's... Let's start um, in, in July of 1970. So I do have uh, all of his log books here, and so I've gone through them and pulled out some, some notes here. So it looks to me like his last flight in the TF-9 in Kingsville, Texas was in July of 1970. Um, and there's about a month gap in there, and then suddenly he shows up at Miramar, and he's flying TA-4s, right, the trainer. So that was probably his basic introduction to, to what? Can, can you maybe elaborate on that? Sure. Sure. Um... More than likely, when he got to Miramar, uh, the, the way they did it, we, we were all in these pools. You know, it was um, slow going when we first checked in. It took us, most of us, maybe, oh, a, a year to 15 months to get through the, the RAG, the RAG, Replacement Air Group Training. Mm -hmm. So more than likely, they sent him over to VF-126 just to get some flight time, you know, just to, to stay uh, somewhat proficient in, in, in a jet to um, keep his hand in before the official RAG training started. So my hunch is, because they did that with a lot of us, there was a lot of time they open, open back seats, so they encouraged us to go over there, you know, put the flight gear on, get out, pull some Gs, fly with um, those flying, those airplanes were at that time the the uh, upcoming Top Gun instructors who were the tactics instructors flying the VF-126 uh, airplanes. So my hunch is 
when he flew with one, uh, the, the TA-4, he was flying in the back seat with, with probably with, with uh, folks who were the uh, Top Gun instructors at that time. Mm -hmm. And then from there, he, he very quickly got into the F-4. Um, according to my notes, first flight in the F-4 uh, is going to be August 26th of 1970, again, ba based out of Miramar. We lived in Poway, so I was, I think, about six months old. My mom says we moved from... Uh, Kingsville to uh, San Diego, the Poway area, right? Um, and his first flight, again, uh, was out of Miramar. And you guys were part of VF-121 if the markings are correct in the logbook. Does that jive with you? Was that a training rag group or, or a squad? Right, okay. right. Uh, VF-121, we are called the the, the, uh, the pacemakers. I was going to say they had, I'm trying to think, maybe 50 instructors maybe and uh, maybe 35 airplanes. A uh, combination of F-4Bs and F-4Js, depending on what, what was up that day to fly. Mm -hmm. So it was a um, a robust squadron with a lot of activity, a lot going on. You know, a lot of you know people checking in, people getting pushed hard to uh, meet their deadlines, get out to the fleet. So it's just a, a very vibrant, uh, active squadron. All, all of our instructors, almost all of them, were combat veterans who had either shot down MiGs or seen service air missiles or anti-aircraft. So it was a uh, a fascinating time to be a young stu flight student flying fighters out at Miramar. I bet. I bet. And let's talk a little bit about your background. How did you end up in the Navy and, and, and more importantly, in San Diego flying F-4s in uh, the early 70s? Sure. I, I grew up just outside of uh, Boston, a town called Framingham, Massachusetts. Sure. Back then, the, um, the Vietnam War was, was in varying stages. Sometimes it would be very intense, other times not too intense. But... When, when I graduated from college, I was either going to get drafted or I could volunteer to go to one of the services. So I went down to a Naval Air Station, uh, Naval Air Station South Weymouth in Massachusetts, thinking I was getting information on the Navy. But the, the gentleman I talked to, who was an officer, told me, he said, I can tell you about the Navy, but, but you don't want to just go into the regular Navy. You want to go into Naval Aviation. Mm -hmm. he, had on a set, he had on a set of wings. He said, I can tell you about it, but nobody gets accepted. So... Um, <laughs> So what I did, I mean, long story short, I bought a book on flying, paid a guy 40 bucks, took a flight, uh, read, read up on the book about what ailerons and rudders and things like that do, and took the flight test, and the guy came back to me. I mean, it didn't happen all that same day. I had to schedule a flight test. You know, long story short, um, went through the process, qualified, went through the eight-hour eight hour physical, qualified for that, went, sent all the resumes and things in. Took about eight to nine months to find out if I was going to get accepted, but, but did get accepted. And then from there, I went down to uh, to Pensacola, Florida, for to start flight training. And uh, I think it was April of '69. But talk about a little bit more about what the purpose of the rag was, and then if you've got any fun stories or memories of of time with my dad, if you want to share those as well. Sure. The, the, what the purpose of the rag was to prepare us for the fleet. So we were, we had our wings, so it was no no longer. Um, I won't say it was adversarial when we were flight students, but it was uh, poignant at times because. You, they had the Navy had their standard. You had to come up to the standard, and, and there were some instructors. I'm mean, having all the instructors were uh, absolutely committed to making sure you came up to the standard. And if you didn't, they let you know it. Uh, you always had to. Everything you did was graded, and it was um, intense competition. The, the, those with the best grades would would get their selections, and most of us wanted fighters. Uh, in my case, I was lucky because I was out of my class of about 22. I was number five. The number one guy uh, selected uh, P3, so propeller airplane. Wow! Uh, had he had he selected something else, I wouldn't have gotten into into jets. But I I, I desperately wanted fighters. That going through Pensacola at the time it was it still is the home of the Blue Angels. But they used to come back from their air shows and circle the field on Sunday afternoons when they came back in. And I I thought that was maybe the coolest thing I'd ever seen when they did. <laughs> As a flight student, you know, marching the class, seeing those Ford Blue Jets uh, come around the field. Oh yeah. But, uh, anyway, the, the main purpose of the RAG, um, it's not that the RAG instructors became our friends, but it was it was not near as poignant as it was going through the training command. Now you had your wings, and now the expectation was to get you ready to become a fleet aviator. So it wasn't, um, I mean, it, and there was, it was no monkey business. There was a, a war going on in Vietnam, and, and the whole idea here was to make sure that we were, were accomplished enough as replacements to get out to the fleet and fly the missions the fleet was flying, not just fly them, but fly them well. Uh, and we were uh, prepared and trained to do that. So so they took um, 
what I would call uh, very uh, determined and diligent efforts to make sure we were ready. And the same deal, they, Navy has their standard. You either came up to the standard at some point, you get it down and it's a, a pink sheet and they would write you up and you'd have to go back and do a refly. And, you know, the ho whole idea there was hopefully you would learn the lesson and, and be better prepared the next time out to uh, come up to the standard. So that's the way it worked. And it was a, an interesting thing because I was there, I checked in right around the time your dad did, I checked in in June of, of 1970. Mm -hmm. My first flight, I don't believe was until, and an F4 Phantom wasn't until like uh, April or May of 71. Mm -hmm. Because we're in these pools, and they sent us a different kinds of training. I'm sure your dad went through the same thing: firefighting school and instrument school, things like mm -hmm. that. And once the once the flying started, though, then it, it got pretty intense, and it picked up. And it seemed like the last two to three weeks, I flying once or twice a day. It was a, um, I guess it was. It seemed like they they jammed ninety percent into the training you needed in the last uh, ten percent of the time. <laughs> Wasn't exactly the case, but more often than not, that seemed to be what happened. There's just the way the way the system was set up. So that's how it went. Now I joined the Navy uh, not knowing how to swim. Oh so no! I, <laughs> I was a uh, a swim hole down at Pensacola for 20 weeks. You know, uh, the whole idea there though was once I learned how to relax in the water, uh, I couldn't believe how easy it was. But I had a, I had trouble with it. It, it took me. Uh, I'm not necessarily a swim hole. I was on sub swim for 20 weeks, mm -hmm. and then I was actually I was held. I, I was not. Pre I was prevented from proceeding ahead with my class until I passed all the swim qualifications. So I had to go to the pool for eight hours a day and swim with each one of the classes that went through there. But you know the Na the Navy has a great buddy system, and uh, one of the things that that I so remember and cherish about the time I knew your dad was was how much he helped me with hmm. with his understanding of electronics and uh, power plants and how jet engines work and hydraulic systems work because I majored in economics in college so I I didn't have that background and, and had a difficult difficult time understanding it hmm. when I had trouble with my swimming one of the guys who helped me out was a fellow who uh, had uh, tried out for the US Olympic team uh, as a swimmer he was from uh, Oregon State and there was also two twin brothers that taught water skiing up in uh, up in Montana, I believe, or, or uh, maybe Washington State. I can't remember exactly. But once I learned how to relax in the water, I couldn't believe how easy, how easy it was. But the folks I just mentioned went out of their way. They spent a huge amount of time working with me, helping me to understand what I needed to do to pass the test. And again, when I had... I won't say severe trouble, but I just couldn't understand uh, the aerodynamics of jet engines and the hydraulic systems and electric, the electrical systems, but your dad understood it real well. And, and he would spend a fair amount of time explaining, you know, in layman's terms, what the instructors were trying to convey to us that was important. Mm -hmm. So I uh, was able to pick up what I needed from your dad to, to pass the test and, and continue to move forward. So I've always been eternally grateful for your dad and people like him that that lent us a helping hand at the times when we needed a helping hand yeah oh that's that's great to hear he uh yeah he, for sure uh, engineering was his forte um and uh from everything i've been told from the stories and, and things i've heard over the years from grandparents my mom uh his sister he, he was just that kind of guy right he just any uh, anything stand out in particular any any funny stories you remember i'm sure there was a a couple of nights at the the um, the officers club, maybe uh, a few uh, Budweisers here and there, and anything you can recall from those times. Most of what I recall is still classified, but um, <laughs> I can tell you, I remember uh, I called you. I called your dad by his first name, by Gary. I said, "Hey, Gary, can I ask you a question?" And he would smile and said, "Sure." And I would explain. I'd be asking something, and he'd look at me, and he'd smile, and say, "Well, let me explain that." <laughs> oh. and I, but I, um, I'd always say, well, hey, I got to write this down. And he'd smile and say, well, if you need to write it down, go ahead and write it down. But uh, he was always, uh, I found him to be always extremely willing to answer the questions. He always did it with half a smile. Like he'd look at me like, <laughs> he never said this is not a good question, but he'd always, I could just tell by the expression on his face, he'd look at me um, and he'd smile. And I, I, I knew it. He didn't. He never said this, but I knew what he was thinking was, 
that's a pretty basic question. You mean you don't understand that? But he never said that. He just explained uh, his understanding of the system that I was having a hard time understanding. And uh, I can't ever recall a time when he went, when after he explained it, I, I didn't say, oh, I got it. Okay, okay, got it. But, you know, we, we, I'd ask him three or four different questions about the system and how the backup systems work and how they interfaced, and he understood them. And I always was grateful for the time he spent explaining that. Yeah, oh, that's, uh, that's great to hear. Um, his last fight was August 23rd, 1971. He was in an F4J. Um, comment says Sherlock. I don't know if the name Sherlock means anything to you. Jim Sherlock, yeah. He was okay. um, one of the uh, uh, flight instructors. Uh, very uh, very knowledgeable guy on uh, electronic countermeasure, electronic counter countermeasure systems. But good guy, very uh, a big, tall, smart guy. But yeah, I think your dad's last flight to uh, VF 121 and mine were just about the same time, August of 71. Okay. And then from there, you're, you're assigned to a. a uh, a fighter squadron, right? Is it did the F the uh, VF one twenty one feed a certain squadron, or, or you guys kind of went wherever the uh, there was need? I should say it, it was pretty much need. But what the squadrons would do is they'd usually send over somebody in their operations department or training department to take a look at uh, who was available and try to you know put first dibs on those that had gotten good grades and those that the you know because all the instructors knew each other from. You know that those that are in the, in the fleet squadrons, more than more than likely, those that were rag instructors had been in those squadrons. They all knew it was a small community, so we all knew each other. So we could talk in very uh, uh, easy terms about, hey, tell me about this guy. You know, what's he like after hours? You know, how was he in the plane? You know, those kinds of things. So I believe what uh, um, most of the squadrons would go over and and have that little preview just to come back and say, hey. Of the eight or nine candidates that are out there, here here's who we should ask for. Mm -hmm. you know, so you didn't always get your wish list, but but uh, more often than not, you did. Yeah. So that's that's pretty much how that worked. You were sent to VF ninety six, right? And is that when where you you met Randy and started flying with Randy? Right. I think your dad, if I recall, uh, I, I would have been happy going to VF one fourteen. They also had an excellent reputation as a squad, and I think that's where your dad went. Yeah. And, and more than likely, um, I knew uh, several of the guys. A, a number of my friends went to VF-114. I knew the, the skipper, and I, I knew a, a number of the, the junior officers that were going there. And it was, it was a good squadron. Yeah. 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 The story my mom tells is um, the guy that graduated first, similar to you, he chose helicopters for some reason. And then it came to my dad and, and, and the next guy in line. Um, one was going to go to VF-96. The other one was going to go to VF-114. They flipped a coin, and uh, he won. Not not my dad, the other guy. I don't know what his name was, but he uh, he won. He chose VF-96, and so my dad went to VF-114. That's the story. So 114 was a good squadron. You're right. There was a lot of good guys there. So um, Commander Box was the uh, the executive officer over there. That's where he got paired up with his Rio. Um, his nickname was, uh, was um, Eddie Power, so they call him Fast Eddie, right, from... Uh, I think from reference from the movie. And there was also another guy in there, uh, his squadron, that went on to do a, a couple of neat things. Um, Denny Wisely, you may know that name. I know Denny well. I'm uh, good friends with Denny, good friends with Fast Eddie Powers. Uh, two yeah. good guys. Yeah. But yeah, he uh, he flew with Wisely, and then Wisely went on to become uh, Blue Angel number one for a while. We had the pleasure of going down to Pensacola and watching them and being a guest of them there. And I've got some great pictures and memories of that. But uh, well, look, I, uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today, Bill. It's, it's just been an honor and a privilege to talk to you. I appreciate talking with folks like you and Commander Queen. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a real blessing, and, and I want to know how much it means. I want you to know how much it means to me, and, and I'll, I'll never be able to repay you for your kindness. But thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Oh, we're, we're happy to do it, and, and I can tell you, um, having known your dad, he'll be very proud of what you're doing today oh, because wow. what, you're, what you're trying to do <clears throat> is help other people understand uh, some issues that are important for the next generation. So. Oh, wow, thank you. 